Well, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome back to Facebook Live. And uh, this has been a busy week for all of us here at Freeway as we are having our virtual vacation Bible school, uh, which is more than virtually a lot of work. It is just flat a lot of work and uh, not quite like we would normally experience with uh, a regular Bible school running buses and having kids coming in by the hundreds. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it's been something that we have uh, enjoyed putting together. I hope that all of you that are watching have had the opportunity to uh, just get in on at least some of the sessions. If not, uh, go to our YouTube channel and you can kind of get a glimpse there of what's going on. It's been a whole lot of fun and uh, being a little zany and crazy at times, but you know, I think the kids enjoy that. They love the laughter and uh, we have had a number of young people that have uh, sent in videos of themselves or their folks have um, saying their memory verses and uh, pictures of them doing their crafts and different things of that sort. And so we're trying to make the very best of the situation that we're in and uh, thanking the Lord that we can do so. And I really appreciate all those that are uh, participating in the effort and all of those who are contributing to it through their prayers and through their financial contributions. And so thank you so much uh, for helping us to minister to young people throughout the course of this week. And of course, uh, those videos are gonna be up there archived on our YouTube channel and uh, they can go back and they can watch that over and over again. And I'm finding that my grandchildren uh, wanna go back and they wanna see it all over again. They wanna see their Uncle Tim eat dog food <laughs> and they want to see Uncle TJ <clears throat> uh, eat hot sauce and uh, it's it's been a fun time and uh, anyway we're uh, glad to be able to do ministry once again in this way if you have your Bible uh, let me encourage you to go to Ephesians chapter 4 Ephesians chapter 4 um, yesterday I had a little tickle in my throat today I do having some uh, uh, allergy issues and I've been taking my temperature twice a day I'm good to go it was 97.1 when I came in this morning so I'm not dead yet and uh, although I am tired <laughs> and uh, I know that uh, many are that have been involved in this um, but uh, anyway we're going to continue talking about the subject that we started with on Monday, and I believe it's something that really we need to consider, and that is the fact that the Bible tells us that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And that means that the Lord has created us anew. He doesn't just clean up the old person, but rather he makes us completely over again. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm grateful for that because the old me was tainted. Whatever even looked good, it wasn't good. It was corrupted. And I needed God to do a work of radical transformation on me. I don't know about you. Um, when I got saved at eight years old, I hadn't even killed anybody yet. I hadn't stolen any cars yet and, and uh, ha hadn't uh, done any criminal activity yet. Do, do you know what I'm saying? When I'm eight years old, I didn't do all that. So I don't know. Some people may look at you and say, well, what a cute little sweet little kid. And I was. And uh, uh, you, you would have for sure said that. But let me tell you something. I needed to be changed because I was rotten to the bone because I was of the seed of Adam. And so were you. And so I needed God to do a radical transformation to recreate me in his own image so that I could have not the genetics of Adam, but I could have literally uh, the nature of God. And that is a, a profound thought uh, that God has given us a divine nature. And uh, that's indeed what he did when he um, saved me and now he's forming me a little bit every day more into the image of Jesus Christ and for all that know him uh, that's a process that he is at work doing now I want to 
uh, in Ephesians 4, read a few verses that we dealt with uh, on uh, Monday and Tuesday. And here the Bible tells us in verse 17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth, there's that word we've been talking about, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling <clears throat> have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation. That's the old way of living. The old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, uh, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. So it begins to enumerate all of the ways in which this new man is going to live out the new life in Jesus Christ. And we're going to get into this a little bit this morning, and I would like for us to just go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you so much uh, for the promise that a new, new day brings. Thank you for, Lord, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And Lord, thank you for a God that uh, continually comes to us and speaks peace to our hearts in the midst of a storm-tossed world and life. God, I pray for the many of our church family that are going through trials of affliction and suffering that you would be with and comfort them. Lord, we, we think of uh, Brother Kurt Chapman and also uh, Pat's son, Lee, and her grandsons, uh, Christopher and Junior, be with them and comfort them. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would comfort the many of our church family that are uh, grieving the loss of a dear friend and sister in the Lord. And God, we just pray now that as we consider your truth, that you would minister to every heart. And Lord, grow us up in our understanding of your word. For this we pray in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. We've been talking about the fact that the Bible really gives us the indication that there are going to be some times in our life where we have what I have called henceforth moments, that from this moment forward, our lives will never be the same again. Um, and <clears throat> I hope that you can identify some of those where you knew uh, from this day forward, things have changed forever. Of course, that happened when you got saved, that was a henceforth moment. From henceforth, you're heaven bound. From henceforth, uh, you're a child of the King. And I hope that you can look to times where uh, maybe the Spirit of God convinced you of some issue that you needed to repent of and you, and you let it go and you knew that from that moment forward you were free. Perhaps there were other times where the Lord uh, revealed to you the, the calling to serve Him and you surrender to that calling, and, and henceforth, uh, you were God's servant. I sat with uh, Brother Kurt quite some time yesterday, and uh, while we were at the funeral home, he shared with uh, Linda and I and Lee uh, that he had uh, a friend that uh, many years ago was a client and a, and a fellow believer uh, that had uh, died in a tragic car accident, leaving a wife and some small boys uh, behind. And uh, <clears throat> the epitaph that was left on his gravestone uh, struck Brother Kurt and he said, I want this to be uh, my epitaph. And it said, he served the Lord and then he went home. He served the Lord 
and then he went home. And uh, he began to weep and he said, that was my wife, that was Patricia, that was Pat. And uh, she served the Lord and then she went home. He said, that's what I wanna do. I just wanna spend the rest of my life serving the Lord and then I wanna go home. And uh, you know, I wanna tell you something. There have been some moments in that man's life that are henceforth moments where there was a time where God dealt with him and from that point forward, nothing was ever the same again. And I trust that in your life, you can identify not just your conversion uh, to Christ, your salvation, but other times where that in your experience with God, uh, you knew that he dealt with you in such an unmistakable way that henceforth, you are not gonna be the same person uh, going forward. You know, um, I think that uh, one thing that would be a blessing for me is if someone that hadn't seen me in 20 years or 25 years um, said, you know, you're not at all like the person I used to know. You're not at all like the, the old guy I used to know way back when. And, uh, and it's my prayer that that might be their thought because I, I pray that in 20 or 25 years that I'm more like Jesus. I'm closer to being what God wants me to be by 20 or 25 years than I was back then. And I hope that uh, they don't say that the change in me is that I have less hair or I have gray hair or I put on more weight or whatever the case might be, but that the difference that they see in me would be Jesus. And I pray that uh, each of us that are involved in this study this morning would have that passion uh, within us to uh, be more like the living Lord and that we put off the former conversation, the old lifestyle. It just doesn't fit with us anymore. I don't, I don't want to be that anymore. You know, uh, I'll tell you what, sometimes the people that give us the hardest times are the ones that have seen us the least. They have talked to it, perhaps not talked to us at all. And all they remember is what they knew from uh, 25 years ago. And uh, all of a sudden they, they see you and instantly they're carried back 25 years and they, they think that that's the person that you are. Well, listen, that may be who I was, but by God's grace, that's not who I have to remain. And that's not who I am. And I trust that, that, that that's your testimony as well. I wanna be more like Jesus every day. I wanna be more formed into the image of Jesus. In heaven, it's already a done deal. But down here, it's a process that I need to surrender my life to. And that's why the Bible says, put, on, con, uh, put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You see, it happens up here. It says, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So it's a choice that I must make. And while God has affected this eternally in the heavens, down here on this earthly plane, I'm to submit myself to the process of daily sanctification, being affected by the Holy Spirit of God and, and more forming me into the image of Christ. And what I need to do is be renewed in the spirit of my mind, be mindful of what God is trying to accomplish. And I need to make myself available to that purpose. I need to be surrendered and submitted to that ultimate purpose in my life because I can fight against that if I'm trying to follow my own lust and go my own way and do my own thing. And that is uh, running counter to what God has ordained for my life. And so when it says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, it means, look, that's a choice that I have to make. That's a choice that you have to make to be renewed in the spirit of the mind and to put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, I wanna share something with you that I think is very consequential and I'm gonna keep my, my marker there in Ephesians 4, but in Luke chapter 22, 
we find the Lord with his disciples uh, on the Mount of Olives, and there uh, he is meeting with them before uh, he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. And in verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he saith unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Now, there are many things that we need to consider in these uh, four verses of Scripture, but I think it is really important for us to notice that the Lord is telling Peter that Satan desires to have you. Satan desires to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now, I'll remind you that here in verse 22, they've already been with the Lord for three and a half years, following him, listening to him, observing his miracles, and, and, uh, and coming to the full awareness that this is the Messiah, God in the flesh. And if we were to rewind uh, to chapter 16, we would discover there that Peter made a miraculous confession of faith. I believe it was there that really it settled in his heart and was given to him by God that Jesus was indeed God in the flesh. He was the Messiah of God. And so I believe at that point uh, he made a confession or a profession of faith in the Lord. But then I believe that God set him on a journey and the journey didn't end in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that journey didn't really even end uh, on the Mount of Olives, Gethsemane, and at the cross because at that point in time, Peter had already denied the Lord. I believe that a new phase of life began for Peter on the shore of Galilee with the resurrected Lord. Because here's what we find the Lord saying. Peter, I have prayed for thee. Now, let me just pause here for a minute. You think on that, that as big as God is, as vast as this world may seem to be to us, and as many people as inhabit this earth, God knows them all by name, and he prays for us. That's a profound thought. Here, Peter is looking into the very face of God, and God is telling him, God, uh, or that Satan wants to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I'm praying for you, Peter, and here's my prayer, <laughs> that when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Some people may say that seems odd to me because I thought Peter was converted when he made his confession of faith. Well, here the Lord is talking about another conversion. You see, the word conversion means a change or a transformation. You know, you can, you can make a decision for the Lord and, and in the economy of God spiritually, you can be holy, blameless, unreprovable before him in love, forgiven, accepted, uh, redeemed, all of these things, blessed in Christ, all of these things, can, can be affected at the moment that you trust Christ as Savior, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're instantaneously uh, reflecting the image of the new man. There are choices that must be made along the course of our life in Jesus Christ, and Jesus was telling Peter, there's going to come a moment that you're going to have to make some decisions, and I'm praying for you that when you're converted, you're going to strengthen your brethren. Now, I want to say something to you. What happened to Peter? Well, the Lord told him uh, that the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. So 
Peter was going to be humbled through failure. It was going to be his denial of the Lord three times in the hour of our Lord's greatest need. You think on that for a moment, okay? Um, that was an egregious failure, but it was only through that humiliation process that Peter came to truly exchange or be converted to exchange the life that he was living for the life that God was calling him to live. And you know, it was after that that the Lord said, strengthen your brethren. Now, you know what? We have it all in the reverse. We think, well, if someone has been humbled through failure, what we need to do is we need to put them in eternal time out, that we need to stick them in a closet and brand them as damaged goods, never let them minister again. And I, I know many among the pale of Bible-believing leaders that behave themselves uh, that very way whenever someone they know has been humbled through failure, uh, they, they want them banished to eternal time out. They want them locked up in the closet of ministerial time out, never to be used again. But you know, I'm gonna tell you something. God has a purpose for your life or you wouldn't be here. Uh, as long as you're drawing air into those lungs, God has a purpose for your life. And what God's purpose was for Peter was this, that he would be humbled through his failure. Everybody else may have said, well, Simon Peter, uh, you need to just ride off into the sunset. You need to go buy a boat and go back to fishing. You need to do something else because you're no, no longer qualified or worthy to serve the Lord. But it was only after that he failed the Lord that he was able to truly fully be used. He said this, look, when thou art converted. So in other words, after your conversion, what was going to take place to occasion that? Well, it was going to be his denial. And what was he going to do afterward? Strengthen thy brethren. He was going to be as an apostle, one who would strengthen the brethren, who would advance the cause of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we find Peter face to face with Jesus in John chapter 21. And the Bible uh, tells us in John chapter 21, if you have your Bible, uh, go there with me. Uh, we find that it says in verse 12, Jesus said unto them, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So now this is the third time that they have sat down with the Lord physically, visibly. And when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lamb. So now the Lord is saying, do you, back in, in, in the, on the Mount of Olives, Peter said, look, all, though all these other disciples will let you down and they'll forsake you, yet will I never forsake you. That's what Peter said. I, I have more fortitude, more love for you than everybody else here, okay? I'll never forsake you. They might, but I never will. And now Peter denied the Lord three times. And now on the third time that Jesus sits down with these men, he looks Peter in the face and he says, do you love me more than these? Do you now say that you love me more than them? After that, you failed me. After that, you have, in the moment that I was being tortured to death, being led through a painstaking process of torturous death, to die for you and you denied that you even knew me and you cursed and you swore and you couldn't even stand up to a little girl outside the hall of Caiaphas. Now, Peter, do you say that you love me more than them, more than these? Is that what you're saying now? 
You know, I'm sure that Peter was mortified. And he, and he answered, uh, yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And the word that Peter used for love was not the word that Jesus used for love. The word that Jesus used for love was agape or a divine, an enduring and an unconditional love. And the word Peter used was phileos, which is a brotherly love, a, a, a sense of a familial love. And, and, and you know, I, I really have this affinity for you, Lord. You know it. The Lord said, what I want you to do is feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Now, Jesus is identifying Simon with Jonas, his father, his earthly DNA. You recall back when Peter made his confession of faith, Jesus said, I say unto thee that thou art Peter. See, so he changed his name from Simon there, Simon, son of Jonas, and then he said, I, I say that you are. So there was a change that took place there, became a child of the living God. And now here the Lord is going back and he's identifying him with not his heavenly father, but his earthly father. And he's saying, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, I, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time. Now, can you imagine... <clears throat> The third time now the Lord's asking him, and I have no doubt at that moment, the Lord looked him clean through. And Peter perhaps couldn't look at the Lord in the eyes because I am sure that the last time that they held eye contact was outside of the hall of Caiaphas as Jesus, having been beaten and now bound, is being led through that hall and he paused just as Peter uh, denied the Lord for the third time and the cock crowed and the Lord turned and the Bible says he looked upon him and at that moment, Peter and Jesus' eyes met. And the Bible says that Peter went out and he wept bitterly. And so I believe that was the last time they had eye contact and held a, a gaze for a moment until this time and now the third time reminder of how many times Simon failed the Lord, denied the Lord. He said, lovest thou me more than these? And Simon was grieved. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. What follows this is the Lord calling him back to a life of true discipleship and telling him that he would die the death of crucifixion and calling him to surrender his rights to be treated as John or anybody else and to just simply take up your cross and follow me. This was going to be the conversion of Peter. It was the beginning of the ministry that God gave to him to strengthen his brethren. And it was a henceforth moment where he laid down his plans and his life. And he chose to take up the very life of Jesus, knowing that it would cost him his life in the end, it would cost him his rights and knowing that from this moment forward, life as he knew it would never again be the same. Today, I wanna to just simply say that some of us have gone through the sting of failure and what it has done is not relegated us to the trash heap in the economy of God. It has somehow uniquely equipped us to exchange the old deceitful fleshly carnal life for the life of God so that we like Peter can then begin to strengthen the brethren. My friends, I want you to know God loves you. And though you may have something in your past like Peter, God still has a purpose for your life. He's still forming you into the measure of a perfect man to the measure of the fullness of the stature 
of Jesus Christ, even as we read in Ephesians chapter 4. So when we get saved, old things are passed away. All things are become new. But it's a work in progress that we have to daily submit ourselves to. And what I would say to you is that God is still working on me and God's still working on you. Let him convert you. Let him transform your life that henceforth you're never again going to be the same person. Don't forget at 10 o'clock we have uh, our first session of the day for Vacation Bible School. Go to the YouTube channel. You'll find it there with the kids. We're going to have a great time with it. Then they're going to break out. I hope many will come down, get their picture taken. The kids can break out uh, of the of the memory verse of Booth and they can give their offerings. It'll be a great time. Then tonight at 7 o'clock and our uh, evening service will be uh, run in conjunction with Vacation Bible School, so it'll be live streamed all together. So whether you go to the YouTube channel or to Sermon Audio, you'll be able to see what's going on in the auditorium. It's going to be a great time. I hope that you'll join us. I want you to know that God loves you, and so do I. Have a great day.